And we're live for episode five of the Ray to Go show. Or if you've been watching us when we were the Ray Bunch show, I believe this would be like episode 90. So it was 90 times I've been sitting here trying to make you believe that I know what I'm talking about. So today uh, we'll see what we're doing. We're going to be talking about early adopters. Actually, we're talking about trailblazers as well. Those people that stick their neck out, uh, you know, are they in danger of getting it chopped off? Is there a real benefit to being a trailblazer? Uh, or is it better to sort of hang behind and kind of uh, innovate and, and, and improve on what the trailblazer did? Who profits by, by, by being a risk taker? And this kind of bookends on our discussion we had on our failure show about people who take risk and people who kind of look, you know, some people who actually embrace failure and, and see it as a stepping, tone, a stepping stone to their success. So today we have Randy Bowden, and we have Jessica Duell, and we have Scott Skelcroft. BL, unfortunately, is home with a cold, so we'll probably see her uh, in the comments, hopefully, because I don't can't believe BL wouldn't have anything to add to the conversation. So let's say hi, everybody. Let's uh, say a word and what you're doing and what's, uh, what's happening in your neck of the woods. Jessica. Holy macaroni, right? Ah. Uh. <laughs> It's sunny, and I guess you could say I trailblazed my way right to Boulder, Colorado this summer, and starting in a new community is quite fun, and so that's really great. I can't wait to hear what everybody else has, has to say this morning. All right, Boulder from Seattle. Boulder we were saying we were talking about earlier that, that actually she's, she's risen higher in life. <laughs> <laughs> she, Randy, found out, she found out there's actually a sun out. I did. I found the sun. <laughs> Randy, how's it going down south? It's going great. It's great. It's a little overcast today and a little chill in there, but that's that's welcome for, for my neck of the woods. But everything's going great. How's the peanut crop doing? Peanut crops are getting they're they're getting dug and and, and picked right now. So uh, I, I was out walking it this morning. You know what defoliant is? It's a chemical that they spray either aerial or, or didn't they do that in Vietnam? Yeah, well, it, it, they they spray it on cotton is what they spray it on cotton, drop the leaves off the cotton, let the cotton balls before they harvest cotton. Oh, I didn't so know that. that that's that, what they that's floating cotton. all in the air. You can always tell cotton cotton picking starting when you start smelling the defoliant in the air. So. What's that smell like? Uh, it's 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 like a my chemical. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what it smells like. I mean, it's like does it smell like raid. Not not like that, but it, it has kind of a Swedish sweet raid smell to it, I guess you would say. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Okay. But you can tell it. And once you smell it, you go, oh, I know what that is. Okay, so you don't have breakfast on the veranda. Like, on I wouldn't, not, not this time of year, especially when you got crop dusters flying around spraying that stuff. <laughs> so, Scotty, how are things in Seattle? Oh, well, you no, know, Jess, I think you'll be very glad to know, not surprised, that it's uh, very cloudy in Seattle today. And over the weekend, we had record breaking rain. So. So there. <laughs> <laughs> I already well, actually I missed the rain a little already. I know it's supposed to be rainy right now. I'm not sure what to do. I'm having an identity crisis, Scott. So to wrap up this weather forecast, uh, in Montreal we're having a little bit of a drizzle, but we had a day yesterday that was unbelievable. It was our Thanksgiving and it was 22 degrees. Wow. We really, if I had known ahead of time, we could have had like a barbecue outside because uh, we had family over for, for dinner last night, and so it was absolutely amazing. I was in the country in the morning in Ottawa, then we drove back to Montreal. Anyway, I hope all my Canadian friends had a fantastic Thanksgiving. Uh, we're, we're going to the big vote next next week. On Monday is uh, the election day, so go out there and vote. All right, on to today's topic, trailblazers. Do you consider yourself a trailblazer? And if you haven't, uh, let me just get something up here, because, because if you're watching this, you could be watching this from YouTube, or you could be watching from my website, and I just want to make sure that you have the address. So this is, uh, this is where it's playing live streaming right now. You can also go back there for the replay, and don't forget to join us right after the show when we have we want you to participate in the conversation and join us with the blab. Today, the co-chair is Randy on the hot seat, and we're going to be discussing and furthering the talk that we had during the show, but we definitely welcome uh, your opinions, your questions, and if you want to change subjects, we can do that too because it's like, it's a blab, right? So that's it. So let's go back to the show, and let's open up with, I have a quote here from a friend of ours, uh, Eli Fennel, who I have a lot of admiration for. He's a very smart cookie. Um, he wrote a post called The Personal Brand Benefits of Being an Early Adopter on Social Media. And early adopter, I mean, I kind of think of it the same way as a trailblazer. There's people who want to start things something new. The difference, I suppose, is that there's a platform created and they want to adopt it. It's a new app, a shiny new toy thing. 
And he was saying the most social networks will fail, but when they succeed, the greatest chance for success on the network uh, accrues to those who adopt it early. So let's talk about that for a little, a little while before we go on to the uh, the trailblazer thing. So what do you think? Do you agree with that? That the pe the people who, you know, put their flag on a platform first benefit the most? I think they actually contribute to the success of the platform while it's in existence. I mean, there are a lot of platforms that have had their the, their limelight moment and they've gone into the background, so they haven't stayed a major play, uh, a major player or a been front and center, yet they still serve a purpose and they're still working in the background bringing people together in those places. And so I would say, yeah, the people who were there early, if they're using it well, regardless of what happens and who takes the first, who takes, you know, who takes the front seat, there's still an opportunity to be working from whichever platform was chosen. You mentioned an important point there, though, is that it, they help the platform succeed for however it lasts. Mm -hmm. Well, it might it might last or might not, but but just brings up a good point with that statement in in the fact that, you know, if 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 the trailblazer is the guy that launches this new network, right? He's relying on those early adopters to get the word out, right? So I mean, they've been a, they they it, it, it's a symbiotic relationship. You need these people uh, to first first place. You look around and you see who are the early adopters, and if they're you know, a stellar group of people, be it if it's social network, a stellar group of people in the social media world or something like that, that start jumping on this saying, hey, this thing's got some grit in it, we like it, you know, um, then that's a that's a plus. Now, whether the program lasts or not, that just depends on funding and, you know, if it's got glitches and things like that, which which some of them do. But Oversight and management of people and resources, yeah. right, Randy? Yeah, yeah but, but the, but, but the the question of today's show, I think early adopter, I mean, there's always risk in anything that you do. You, you had a, if you don't, if you're not willing to take the risk, I think, I think Scott's uh, statement that I read earlier today uh, was, uh, you want to share that, Scott, about dancing? Uh, it, was it, uh, it is better to have loved and lost than to have never loved it? Uh, yeah, and that, that's just it. I mean, if you don't take the chance, you know, you're never going to experience. So, uh, so yeah, there's risk there, but the early adopter that gets in on the game, you know, gets the goodie first, first prize, I think is going to benefit in the long run. I don't believe that that really closes the door for a late adopter, though. I agree. And let's take an established industry um, like transportation. We have buses, we have trolleys, we have subways, we have taxis, and there was still this big gap there, and who came along? This crazy idea from the, this, this seemingly crazy idea that is revolutionizing public transportation or the ability to obtain transportation on the go was Uber. I mean, that's a really good example of a late, somebody who's looking at an established industry finding a need that is a really big gap across the board and creating a service that solves that need in a very established industry and I think that yeah. that's something that we could do in any industry. People yes. could step up. Scott. So words that I've lived by and this is thanks you know quite frankly uh, thanks to Randy and it's because he interviewed Mark Schaefer once and it was be first and be overwhelming uh, and so it, Uber is a perfect example of that because they were first and they were overwhelming within their niche. So uh, I, I guess it depends on how far in you want to zoom that telephoto lens and uh, then you can identify who the early adopter is or who the innovator is. It might be that it's the trailblazer within a narrow niche rather than you don't have to be a trailblazer and in and discover the continent. You could be a trailblazer by, in you know, discovering Seattle, and then if you do, you have first choice at the prime real estate for a view. Now, if you stay there or not, you can be king. You have the opportunity to be king on the mountain, and others are going to try and knock you off. But at least you have the advantage of others have to knock you off rather than you're being, you know, down there trying to knock someone else off. So that's well, the advantage. 
I'm I'm going to disagree on on the on the Uber example because I I would classify them as innovators as opposed to trailblazers. They took an idea. I mean, the whole sharing economy has been going on for some time even before that. But you know, the idea of a taxi, a personalized taxi. I mean, they had lots of money to build that on that on that kind of model, car sharing, all that type of thing. So I'm not giving them less credence for what they did, but I wouldn't call them necessarily a trailblazer. Uh, they upset the apple cart, which is a well, little. That's, that's yeah, what I, I was going to say. Well, they're disruptors. They were, working, yes. they were disruptors. They yeah. took a model, a working model, but a lot of people he he saw it as broke. How can we do that? And 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 it worked because people went, hey, you know, I like this. I mean, if you remember when Uber first started, there was a lot of icky feelings about that. I mean, you know, who's this? Who's who? How am I getting this car? And everything. now it seems like it's. I mean, in New York City, it's pretty. Pretty prevalent. I mean, it's that's very urban I'm interested thing sure. in this conversation because if everything under the sun has already been created, how can we have trailblazers then? I don't think everything under the sun has been been. Uh, well, and I think Uber is an example of something that's new. I mean, yes, yeah. it took existing things, but they did disrupt it. They connected things in a different way that had never been connected before. And I think that your local locksmith or your local real estate agent. Uh, they might not be known nationally or internationally, but they make waves in their local community, and they are just as much a disruptor as somebody like a Facebook or an Uber, somebody like that. In my opinion, it doesn't matter the scale; it matters the impact that you have on those in your life. What about it matters in the circle that you travel in? I mean, yeah. who who would remember is like a discovery on a microorganism, unless you're in science? You know, take take the example of early explorers. I mean, when the explorers first came to to well, say Nova Scotia in in 1603, the first settlement died, right? And they died of starvation, da, 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 da. So I took another person who actually learned the lessons of that of, of that first exploration to succeed. Uh, so the trailblazer, yes, you can say, well, it was first discovered on this date, rest in peace. But it was the people who followed through that, that you know, that gained by it. What about, what about the exam this, this example right here, Hangouts on Air and Blab? Mm-hmm. I mean, is, isn't isn't Blab kind of taking Hangouts on Air to a different level, or taking something that gives you a video and an audio and a, a way way to to uh, video blog or or video cast? Uh, You're talking about Crowdcast, Randy, aren't you? Yeah. No, I'm talking about the Blab, Blab. platform oh, okay. versus the Hangout Google. So so Blab comes on, they take on Google, really, really well, Google. You know. Uh, the you know all along we've uh, at, well I'll only speak for myself uh, and that is that I was expecting a gold rush that people would discover what we know about hangouts on there and they think wow this is really terrific and there would just be a flood of people and we are now experiencing that gold rush it's just that we're we're mining the wrong mountain the hill. Sure, there's there's a little bit of gold and then the, them are hills and Google but there's a whole other range of um, you know, mountains out there that have even more gold to it, and that's where most of the people are are migrating to. So, does that mean that uh, Hangouts on Air would be, in Ray's example, the trailblazer? And then, then if so, what about all of these people who are on Blab, which appears to be gaining some sort of traction, it's, rather than being a shiny new object? Hmm. What would you say? If what would who? What would you call? Let's label something. Let's say take Facebook and we take Google. Uh, and then we take Apple, those h okay. major huge companies. Who would you classify as a trailblazer as opposed to an innovator? Okay, uh, Apple, think, Apple and Facebook, definitely. I think innovation is part of trailblazing, so I'm going to have a hard time with this particular. Okay, part. someone who actually created something new and, and, and took off as opposed to someone who improved upon what they what they saw that was out there and made a new product based on that. Well, you could you could say that you could say that about Apple, right? Yeah. But Apple, you know, Jobs Jobs saw something that was already there and changed it, right? Just like yeah, exactly. Just face, face, there was already there was already something similar to Facebook. Yes, MySpace, Zuck, for example. Zuck, Zuck, Zuckerberg took that and changed it. So I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that's gonna. But but Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs. I guess hit hit you know they hit the grand slam when they came up with it and uh, what they what they brought to the marketplace just stuck. Now people still today, 
are amazed at what Apple has able to do the the the, the loyalty to that product and it and it's not I mean you know the Apple haters out there uh, it, oh it's doomed it's never and every time they roll out some new product um, it it just blows blows people away so uh, so and you know but you can't argue the fact that they that Apple has changed our culture they changed the way we listen to music for good or bad uh, there's a lot of changes that Apple is responsible for same thing as Facebook. Right? Yeah, but there's here's a the difference. The, there, Facebook used the technology because technology is continuing to iterate. And I look at Facebook as taking advantage of the technology as soon it was a, as it was available. I look at Apple and I see a vision of what technology is necessary to get us something that would change our culture and how we interact with stuff. Does that make sense? And so they're both innovators, and I think they're both trailblazers, but I think they have very different approaches. One is saying, okay, finally, I have something that's faster, because before Facebook and MySpace and those guys, where did people go? They went to forums. They went to news groups. They went to download.com and CNET and windows95.com. I mean, think about how long ago those were. Those are the predecessors to our social media platforms today, and without them, Facebook could never exist. Without them, Blab and Twitter would probably not exist because as the technology changed and became easier, people were ready and they were thinking about how could we do something and they were waiting for somebody to invent a possibility for them to deliver their vision. Where Apple has created a vision and they're figuring out how to develop their own vision. And I think both are very important parts of trailblazing. Well, you have, have to give, you have to give Apple the credit for the smartphone, right, or the iPhone. And when they rolled that iPhone out, they virtually put, uh, you know, desktops and laptops in your hand. And yeah. it, and it, and since since the early iPhone came out to to the one that's in today, it has nothing but in every reiteration of it, it adds just so much more that you have in your hand to do. I mean, your banking, everything is done out of a little device that's as thin as a wallet. Okay, so let's take this back then, because we're talking about huge companies in the Silicon Valley area. So what? So I mean, obviously that, that's all about innovation. In fact, they Google gives you have to have 20% of your time towards just thinking, you know, and, and creating stuff. What about businesses on street level? Is it is it easier to sort of wait and see and, and let the other guy take the risk? Uh, and what kind of businesses you think are more prone to 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 being a trailblazer? What about what about the what about the local cafe? Um, I mean, let's just step back a couple of years. The local cafe that you know he sees something and all of a sudden he goes, "Hey, how can I get people to come in here more?" Wi-Fi. So he adds Wi-Fi, and then he you know when they first started doing, you had to charge or whatever. But he said, "I got free Wi-Fi in my restaurant." Is he an innovator? Is he a trailblazer? For his community, he could I think be. he's a trailblazer. I mean, he, he, and if he's the first one to do it, I mean, all of a sudden, then the you know the guys going, hey, how come Jess and, and Ray are always going over there to Randy's cafe? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's a trailblazer because he's taking a business model that people have resisted. The fact that you allow people to sit in your restaurant uh, without you know having food in front of them all the time and stuff like that, and he's taking a chance that he's building loyalty to the re to to the place and all that. So yeah, that was that's adventurous. I think that's sticking your neck up for sure. I would say it's about reliable information. And so here I am, I can, I'm a, a store owner, we'll say I'm a local salon owner and I do nails and hair and waxing and, and it's very important to me to connect and, and make this a community place like you would see in all those wonderful chick flick movies, right, that have hairstylists as the center point. Um, so if I'm trying to do something different, part of being a trailblazer is thinking about it. Just because there's an idea doesn't mean... We, I would act on it right away as a business owner because there's risk. I might think about it for a year. I might think about it for two years because what am I doing? I'm doing my job. I'm serving my customers. I'm listening to their needs. I'm testing out my idea in my head or on paper. Would it help in this situation? Would it help in this situation? Would it help in this situation? And once I have all of that, it becomes a little bit more bulletproof and I've got actual data to take action with. Then I can compare that data to maybe larger companies or companies in other industries in my community that I look up to or want to emulate in some way 
and I'm going to test my idea against their model and what's the same and what's different so that when I do enact this, I'm not scrambling and I have problems and the delivery is not very good or whatever the, you know, my customer service has to decrease. I actually am taking the time. So I think it comes down to reliable information, whether that's hand gathered, whether that's reading a lot and formulating an idea and just thinking on it. Because I do think you said, Ray, there's something about Google spending time creating and thinking 20% of the time. I think it should be more than that. I think people should be thinking and reading and gathering information like 50% of the time. Yeah, but the typical business owner doesn't have the luxury of that time to do that, to be creative. Not in a work hour, but there's books to be read, there's news to be watched, there's conversations to be had, all and those types of conversations. You can gather little bits when you talk to each of your customers throughout the day on a particular topic to get an opinion or a thought process for what might be happening hyper-local. Hmm. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a, and this goes back to maybe, maybe that, Maybe that's an innovator idea. I don't know, but the only way to be a trailblazer, I think, is to understand what I want to do, what my vision is, and then how to better solve somebody's problem that they're using solutions that aren't working for them. I think all of those fit in there, and you need information to do that. Well, in 2015, I mean, it's it maybe surprising to us because we tend to be on the edge of technology, but there's a huge, huge majority of people who are way behind who don't even have their ear on the on the rails and listening to what's happening in, in technology. So how would you, or why, or would you, uh, try to convince a, again, a, a small business owner, because large businesses have staff to do this, uh, to take the chance and and you know work on their on their company cult uh, social culture, uh, invest on social media, work on their on their digital marketing. Really, how, how what would you tell a, a client, a small business? Why would it, that be worth doing? Maybe, maybe there maybe there's a correlation between what we were talking about and um, investing. So they say when you're young and and eager, you can be you know you're supposed to invest money, but you can have a a, a balanced portfolio, but you can take more risk with certain uh, stocks and so forth. By the time you get close to retirement age then you change the profile of what you're doing so that it's a little less risk-taking and a little bit steadier. So I'm sure that there's some sort of characteristic curve that you can identify yourself in. How risk-adverse are you or how much risk are you willing to take in order to get ahead? What we're really talking about, as I see it, is a continuum, a spectrum from you know, the early adopters, you can have the leaders, innovators, trailblazers, change agents, you know, then you have early majority, then you have the late majority, and then you have the laggards. So there's a whole process of in of adoption, of innovation that people can go through. So the answer to you is, you know, what is it what is the sweet spot for your company right now to be best for you? And there's no one no one um, answer. Um, but you're talking it, about calculated risk, Scott. You're, what I hear you saying is, you're talking you're talking about this continuum. But in the end, it's am I taking action with information, or am I taking action just because I have an idea? And your risk, to, oh, somebody's risk tolerance would say, how much information do I need before I take action? Yeah, but do, do actually people even care about early adopters? Do they care that you're first oh, at yeah. something? If you're really? nearly doctor, you care. Really? The guy at the barbershop at the corner, does he actually care that you, you're you the first person on, on Google Plus or on Facebook or whatever? Well, okay, but in that, I, I think there's a difference between somebody like a barber and uh, somebody who's creating a new technology. I mean, look at Kickstarter. If, if yeah, but okay, let's take the technology because I think, again, yeah. as we said before, that's such a small, small uh, portion of the population. Technology always pushes the envelopes. And that's what scares a lot of people. I mean, that's what we're kind of like pushing so against. So let's say your barber shop wants to open a second location. They're at the max. They have they have been thinking. They know exactly where they want to be, but they don't have the capital to do that. I think technology like Kickstarter would be a perfect example of somebody who's got clientele, who would help spread the message, who has a great story and wants to expand and serve their community more. And those are the types of stories, when done well, how a community can get another location. I mean, in Langley, Washington, we used to go there all the time. We contributed to a Kickstarter campaign to get a restaurant off the ground so that this guy's dream could come true. And he told his story and he had his family and then, I mean, it was a really cool 
it, it was a really cool way. So I think there is a way to use technology when somebody's ready and as a means to getting them on their dream, not to use technology for the sake of technology, but to use technology to continue to serve their customers in the best way possible. Randy, well, you, you, said, you, you okay. said it was forced. I mean, t uh, 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 technology is, you know, pushes everything. I think if you're a business right now, you need to be looking at how can I integrate, if I'm not, how can I integrate more technology into whatever it is? If I'm the local grocery guy or whatever, think of what came to mind and she was talking about a salon and all that. Um, what about the barber on the corner that still only deals in cash? He gets great customer service, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the, he's a gentleman. He's got his clientele. He's been cutting guys' hair and doing all this stuff, and 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 he's he's kept up with the latest styles and all that. But as far as his shop goes, it's still kind of old school. Would he might would he might gain some additional clientele if he if he adopted some kind of uh, Apple Pay or something in there that most people who don't carry cash anymore they got to go. God dang, I got to pay five dollars at the ATM to get a to get a $25, $25 to pay for my haircut. Yeah. Right. You Can I ask you Randy? I was going to ask you. Oh, I'm sorry, Jess, but I was going to ask Randy, actually, given that you had worked a lot with, with, with companies, uh, what kind of percentage of, of your clients you would, you would label as being adventurous or risk takers or someone that would uh, be willing to, to, to stick their neck out? Uh, a very low, very low percentage. Very low. They're all mostly followers. Yeah, yeah, and I, and they I think sit, they, sit back, they sit back and they watch what's what's going on, and they're not they'll they'll listen to a new idea, but they're going to let somebody else try it first, or they're going to they're going to say, show me an example of that. Let me see an actual live example of that. They're not going to they're not going to risk their money in it. But I, and I think that's the majority, and I think that's probably why we have to get out from behind the computers and go out into the streets to get a sense of what's really happening out there. Because I mean, as much as we're excited. Uh, about Blab, for instance, and there's still, I don't haven't come across one person who's not in digital marketing or on the space that knows what Blab is. And yet, as you say, you can look at Blab and, and you'll see streams and streams and streams of shows. But, uh, but, but let's, let's, let's be honest, let's be real honest, okay? You, you know, the majority of people that are on these platforms, they're doing it for what? They're just filling up airtime, right? They're not really using this as a money-making, it's not their business, it's not, I mean, I, look at Blab, there's some interesting stuff on there, but I, I'll go on there occasionally and, and look around and I see these, how do these people just sit around all day and go from show to show talking to, talking to what do they do, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so, so I, yeah, can Twitter can I use Twitter to enhance my business? I don't know. Let me look back. How could I use that? I want to connect with a certain group. Maybe I can use, as people come in, I gather their Twitter handles, and every time I'm going to run a bourbon special at my bar on Thursday, uh, whatever, I can send out a quick message, you know, and make sure that they get that alert, you know. And now that might be 15 people or it might be 1,000 people. But, you know, that those type things will work for, you know, individuals that are willing to do that and gather that. You know, how can I take Instagram? Okay, I'm going to have a campaign where, you know, you you buy my whatever, you take a picture of it at your house, we're going to judge it and give away something. So you submit all these Instagram pictures with, and you flag my business in it. I mean, there's, there's ways to do that on a low scale, not take very much. So if you're a local barber or if you're a General Motors, you can use those platforms in that way. Yep. I and see Blab. Sorry, excuse me, Jess, go ahead. That's okay. And that's actually one of the things that I like because what, Randy, I hear you describing is something along the lines of it's, it's one more step. I'm already collecting information about these people. I already have their names. We already have some sort of connection. So I'm extending that connection in uh, not even in a new way. I'm just extending my connection. I'm deepening that relationship. And that is the strongest way to create a following that would allow for all of the stuff that people talk about, trust, and engagement, and actually building an ROI. It's because people care about what is being shared by this local business. Well, well you, you were in the restaurant business, you know, and you, you've worked in that, that 
that line of work for, for a few years. Um, nowadays, you, every restaurant you go in there, they get a little sign like it's on Facebook or it's on their window or something like that. You know, well, how many, how many of those people that put up the little sign are actually every now and then or say on a regular basis saying, you know, choosing from their local clientele and giving them a meal or comping them something in the restaurant or do sending them something to their house, you know, or something like that. Taking that taking that extra effort to actually instead of saying, Hey, like us and we got a thousand likes. We're all taking well, that effort to do something. And let Scott talk as he's we're at the end of the show. So Scott, you had something to say? Well, I was just responding to something uh, Jess was saying, and it was the to share and video labs, hangouts are so ephemeral. You do it, and then they're gone. So it's not exactly what you do. It's how you repackage it, how you reshare it, how it gains momentum over time, rather than just... Um, and that's where most people, I think, fail, is that they, they put out a video, and that's the only time. And something that happened six months ago could be really big, but it's not because it's just there on the shelf collecting dust, unless they repackage it and reshare it. That was That's what a I perfect sequence to what, how, how I want to close uh, actually this discussion, because platforms like Blab and even Hangouts on Air for me are not the end uh, in and of themselves. They're basically content creation platforms. You know, uh, like Blab for me is more valuable after the Blab uh, whether you use it as a podcast or whatever, uh, than it is the actual show. Yes, we may get 50 people interacting, and that's all nice, but it's gone. As you say, it's ephemeral. It's, it, it's, it disappears. Same thing with Hangouts on Air. I think I've got one viewer watching this live right now. But, I mean, that's, you know, I, I do this because I don't have a sponsor paying me to do this. I'm doing this because I love the conversation, and I, and I, and I love digging into this. And, and I do this for 90 times now uh, because I don't know a lot. And every time I do a show, I learn a lot more. And since I'm getting old, I have to keep the brain cells going, you know? <laughs> so the you know, the whole thing with the blab and those things is that you know, we have we have trailblazers. Say Google's a trailblazer, the people who create a blab, you know, but it's we who innovate off of that and we basically define what that platform is. So I think that I just want to leave you with that because in, in a sense, we're trailblazers whether we know it or not. Even if you, you don't consider yourself a risk taker, there are risks you take every day of your life without even knowing it, whether you decide to, to cross on that yellow light or, or whatever, you know. Uh, but as far as technology and working with clients and all that, it only is worth the risk if you can see a reward for it at the end of it. You know? So keep that in mind. We're going to go over now to our post-show blab. Uh, you can get there if you don't have the, uh, it's in the event page or it's on this page as well, but it's at uh, blab. I am slash uh, Ray Hiltz, and we're going to continue this conversation. Randy's going to co-chair with me, and you're very welcome to jump in and, and continue the conversation about innovation and early adopters. So thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.